I'm Jim. And I'm Garrett. And this... Wait, let's do it again. Okay. I'm Jim. And I'm Garrett. And this is... Jim and Garrett at the Jim movies. <laughs> All right, we're a little off there, but this... Welcome to Jim and Garrett at the movies. We are talking today about Richard Linkletter films. This will be like... This will bring the grand total of Richard Linkletter films that we have reviewed up to three, which I think is more than any other director. bit surprising there, but we'll be talking about Where Do You Go, Bernadette, uh, and 2014's Boyhood, as well as discussing the latest news from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, sad news, too. So let's start with Where Do You Go, Bernadette. We're going to uh, talk about, so uh, this is a film that stars Kate Blanchett, Judy Greer, Billy Crudup, Lawrence Fishburne, Megan Mullally, Steve Zahn, and introducing Emma Nelson. Now this is, tells the story of, essentially, I don't actually want to tell you what story it is, because the best way to talk about this movie is to tell you to forget everything you've seen in the marketing, everything you've seen about the plot, and even the title. I don't know what title Where Do You Go Bernadette belongs to, but it's not this movie. Instead, think of this film as a really complex and I think rather interesting and compelling family drama. Now this is a, a film that eventually I'm going to be recommending, but I'm also going to be talking a lot of shit about. What about you, Garrett? I think that uh, I agree broadly with what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I, re I was very taken aback by how misleading the trailers were and the marketing was, and yeah, the, the, the title itself. I was expecting there to be a first act, and then uh, when, once we hit the second act turn, maybe 25 minutes in, Kate Blanchett would disappear, and then we'd see a series of flashbacks or something along those lines if you try to piece together where she went. Um, that is structurally speaking not at all what happens now what does happen i think is is generally pretty good and i suppose i'm glad to be surprised i like it when films surprise me but in a certain sense it's, it almost seems like it's misleading from the point of view of, of you know the trailers and the marketing uh, so i was surprised not because the film itself per se surprised me but because I was, there was a misdirect all in all it's a worthwhile effect at the end but it does bring up some interesting questions about the relationship between film and trailer and spoilers and etc and so forth uh, so, like you, I, 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 I'm going to recommend it. I think it's a, a good film. Um, uh, but it also is, in some ways, a curious and a strange film, both on its own merits and for a Richard Linkletter film. Right. So I'm going to agree with part of that. I think this does sort of fit into Richard Linkletter's corpus, corpus which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But let's kind of... I, I don't think it's a spoiler to tell our viewers simply that Bernadette doesn't go anywhere for the first hour of this movie. So the idea that this is a mystery, it's not. The idea that it's uh, any sort of, um, that, that there's a whodunit or anything like that, it's not. It's none of those things. In fact, so that's, and structurally, this film is a bit of a mess. It really is. Like, there is... Uh, a weird discernible maybe first act there's some exposition that is kind of shoehorned into multiple acts of this movie and that exposition is doesn't necessarily lead to a lot um there's some dropped plot threads or dangling pr plot threads don't want to mix my metaphors and it, there's uh there's a lot of messy structural issues with this film but at the so I, I'll give you a chance to sort of comment on that stuff and then and then I'll tell you why in the end I'm recommending it. Yeah, I, 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 maybe I want to work from the other direction. I, I generally like to start with the things that I like about the films before I criticize them. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I want to praise it before I bury it, as as it were. Um, I, I think Kate Blanchett is absolutely fantastic. In Agreed. Film. Her performance is incredibly layered and nuanced. The character uh, that she is portraying is, is very rich, very well written. Uh, I, I have not read the novel that it's based on, so I'm not sure how much of the credit to that goes uh, to, the, to the novelist Maria Semple and how much of that goes to the, 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 the screenwriters. 
Um, but, uh, but I really found this character interesting, uh, uh, nuanced and detailed and uh, lots of different perspectives. Oftentimes I thought I had her number and I thought I was going to anticipate what she was going to do in response to a particular circumstance. And she didn't. She responded in a way that was much more, as it were, humanistic rather than as a character. You know, when you when you when you write a character, you think you, you that the, the, sort of the character then dictates the action, and you can sort of get your head around it. But in real life, of course, human beings often are more complicated than that. They they they, they have different moods and different attitudes, and you catch them in a different day, different time. They're going to react differently, necessarily, than you anticipate. And I think that that the character of Bernadette Fox uh, uh, shows that 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 complexity and that uh, and that that the difficulty of really getting to know a person and understand it. And that fits so perfectly with the theme of the film, which of course is precisely that the family can't really get a hold on her. Um, you, you mentioned the title, Where'd You Go, Bernadette? I think actually you know, the marketing makes it seem like it's a disappearance. And uh, But in fact, what it is, it, it, it's not so much a disappearance so much as, as she sort of gets lost in herself. Uh, right. you know, she, she, she's uh, you know, used to be this hotshot architect and she's sort of lost her purpose and lost her direction. So the where'd you go actually refers sort of more to the existential direction of her life rather than the location of her person. Um, and, and so, the, you know, again, the appropriate complexity of the character and the, and the different aspects of her that we see as she struggles and wrestles to deal with her daughter growing up, uh, uh, with the precise situation of her professional career, how she relates to her husband, um, uh, how she relates to the outside world, to her neighbors and to the other parents at her, at her daughter's school and so forth. All of these things push against her, and it's done so organically and so sort of naturally speaking as it goes sort of from one sequence to another, one context to another, that we get to see these different aspects of her. And it's it, it, it's it's really well done as a character study, I think. And, and and so that was to me the clear standout of the film was that we was that was that the filmmakers uh, and and Kate Blanchett in particular give us a, a window into the soul of this character Bernadette Fox that was. Uh, expertly done from the point of view of filmmaking. And let's also, while we're heaping praises on actresses, let's talk about Emma Nelson. I think she is absolutely phenomenal in this movie. She is a revelation. She is what this is the best uh, young person performance I've seen since Elsie Fisher in eighth grade. And you know how much I love eighth grade. This is a phenomenal performance. This is a richly layered character. These are two women. Two female characters that are richly layered, and the film gives each of them a chance to to breathe. I think that Billy Crudup is good as well. He's got a, a great deal of complexity, and I like some of the things that the plot does with that character. Um, although there are some plot threads having to do with Billy Crudup's character that, that uh, dangle too much. Uh, but that's more screenwriting than performance. Um, so yeah, I want to also highlight Emma Nelson. I think she's just fabulous in this movie. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was sort of surprised. Yeah, I remember watching her and thinking, do I know her? She's, you know, she seems very, I mean, again, polished almost sounds like a backhanded compliment. But I, 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 what I mean by when I say that is she seems professional. She seemed like she really... Uh, had a handle on how to, to, to play the character, and it's the sort of thing you expect someone uh, uh, to, to have to develop over time with a lot more sort of uh, uh, practice and experience. But yeah, as her first feature, she, she, she knocks it out of the park. So let's talk about this film. So d let me give you a chance to shit on it. Um, do you agree with a lot of my structural complaints and, and issues with regard to that? Well, I okay. Difficult in some ways to speak about the structural problems without getting too much into spoilers. But yeah, it, it definitely defies what you might call the sort of traditional structuring of a film. There's no clear uh, first act, uh, second act, third act. Um, uh, a four act structure, even a five act structure doesn't seem to clearly apply. There, there's, there, it seems like there's really only one clear break point in which you can identify, okay, now we've moved on to a different portion uh, a, a different act in the film. So if anything, I would almost say it's a two-act structure with a you know an hour and ten-minute first act and then like a 40, 50-minute second act. Um, now, it's, I, I, I enjoy structure. I like structure. And it exists for a reason. Uh, but of course, it isn't uh, absolutely necessary. You know, some of the best films in the world defy structure and and, and reject traditional structural uh, uh, um, norms. Uh, but it, it, in some ways, it seemed a little strange in this film just because. I'm not sure why it, they did it that way. I mean, perhaps it was because they were trying to stay true to the source material and the source material led them to that. But this is a film that easily could have had some fairly straightforward structure imposed on it uh, uh, if they decided to, to, if they decided to, to do it that way. Uh, and 
Linklater's films you know, are, are, are not necessarily the most rigidly structured, but usually there's at least something you can piece together in terms of, uh, of a broad arc, um, but not so much here. So I, it, I, I wouldn't come necessarily call this shitting on it so much as just walking away with sort of some curiosity as to why they, they, they chose not to do that. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, and I also, but I, I do consider, I, I think that you kind of, you alluded to what I think is the problem. And I think that this is a rich and textured, wonderful book that I haven't read. And they were trying to get all of that richness and texture into the movie. And it just became so stuffed that they forgot to, that they didn't, didn't uh, tie a lot of a lot of things together and that it was um you know structurally messy uh so now let's i but i want to transition i this movie has a ton of heart this movie is just it's it's got so much heart and it's so difficult for me to like a film that is so sincere and so humanistic um i find this film to be i'm i am incredibly drawn to stories like this and to films like this and i think this film is just it's it's a lovely world to be in and it's a richly textured world to be in and uh that said there's certainly criticisms about the world that i think are traditionally link letter uh one of the things that I is sort of unlocks all of Richard Linklater's uh, work to me is that almost all of his films are uh, in some way against the establishment, the individual against the establishment. And you have some characters who represent establishment, uh, the establishment, and those characters are ultimately made to be villains. And this is most obvious in Fast Food Nation. Um, but I think it applies to his, his broader work as well, both the, both of the films that we're going to be talking about today. And so this is a story about a woman who gets lost, uh, get, gets, um, lo uh, finds her, 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 wanders away from her individuality, wanders away from what makes her her, and in some, in a, larger sense a suburban establishment uh definition of life and happiness is imposed upon her and that establishment life and happiness is something that she cannot that she's desperately trying to navigate because she knows that that's what ex what is expected of her and yet she cannot do it and i find that d personally compelling and uh in a way just originally rendered i i i was expecting this kind of uh thesis from link letter and i think he told it in a new and creative and different way in this movie and uh that's why i with all of its flaws i'm gonna end up recommending it so um you think this is a very very link letter-ish film uh, and do you use the word heart? And in that sense, yes, I agree. A lot of Link Letters films have a, a tremendous amount of heart. There's a lot of earnestness in his, his oeuvre. Um, and, and that is the case. But I want to point to some things which struck me. Again, I, if you hadn't told me this was a Link Letter film, I wouldn't have known. Because uh, here are things that this film has, that, uh, or this is what di di differentiates this film from most of Link Letters films. For one thing, this is an almost entirely uh, a, a cast of women, and that's that's awesome, and that's fantastic, it's wonderful. Like, you know, I, I, you know, there's obviously issues re regarding uh, women in Hollywood, and I, I mean, it's good to see so many women put, uh, put front and center uh, in a film. But almost all of Link Letters other films are are from a male perspective. I mean, you know, we're talking about Boyhood being an obvious example. But you go back, you know, you look at School of Rock. You look at Waking Life. You look at Dazed and Confused. You know there are female characters in these films, and, and they're important. And you know I think they're generally at least pretty pretty fleshed out and pretty three dimensional. But the perspective is almost always told from a, a, a male point of view. So that's that, that that's a difference here. And, and again, good for Link Letter. He's trying to go for a different different perspective there. Another thing is that almost all of his films, music is so important. Music it pl plays such a key role in Richard Linklater's films, and there's almost no music in this film. There's precisely one song uh, that, the, that mom and daughter sing to each other that matters, but uh, there, there's, there's no real sort of soundtrack. There's a score, 
Um, uh, but but the, 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 there's no you know, you know pop music, no rock music, kind of that, which which is, is so key to so many of his other films. Um, so so it, it, it's, it's different. Like, and I could go on, but I, I don't want to uh, go on for too much. But you, you get the idea. You know, this did not feel to me like a link letter film uh, uh, because of so many of those differences. I can see where you're coming from there. Um, I think stylistically it's not... Uh, I, I think we can agree that stylistically it might not be a Linkletter movie, um, as Linkletter as you know, other Linkletter movies are, but uh, I think philosophically it certainly fits within his, his corpus. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the heart of this movie is what drew me to it the most. I mean, I, I found this... It was it was surprising how much I was able to ignore um, in in order to like this movie and and at the end of the day I'm glad I did so um, I'm ready to close up are you? Um, yeah, I think I'm good. Okay, so what would you give it out of five? I give four out of five. Four, okay. Um, I'm at three. Uh, it's a recommend, but it's because of it's. You know, I I let you know why. Um, I think I can't go that much. I I think I can't go to four just because of all the structural issues. But that said, I I liked it more than I think it deserves. Um, so let's move on to Boyhood. This is a film that I actually liked a lot more on the second viewing. 2014's Best Picture nominated Boyhood, written and directed by the man of the hour, Richard Linkletter. This film stars L.R. Coltrane, uh, Ethan Hawke, and Patricia Arquette, who won the Best Supporting Actress for this role, probably the most deserved Best Supporting Actress statue ever given. Um, it is a, a story of a young boy growing up and uh the man he becomes uh garrett this is the first time you've seen boyhood what do you think this film was a challenge for me in a number of ways okay. um I, I one of the things i remember very clearly from when i was in high school uh was the fear i mean an existential fear that when i grew up i would forget what it was like to be young uh you know i i, I I wasn't, you know, a kid who longed to be an adult, you know, who, uh, you know, who wanted so much to have that sort of freedom and independence. But at the same time, I, I wasn't desperately clinging to my youth either, at least not in high school. Um, but, but I do remember, you know, seeing in movies, for example, when you had older characters coming to the recognition that they that they'd forgotten what it was like to be young, um, and how, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily painful it was for them as characters, but uh, but how painful it was for me seeing them. Uh, disconnected from themselves, and you know, there was a, there was a part of me that desperately wanted the authenticity that I felt was so present when I was a teenager to carry through for the rest of my life, and the fear of losing connection to that person that I was really scared me. And as I went back into this to this film, which obviously again, you know, it, it might be different for for women doing the film, but definitely I think for for men who have gone through many of these experiences, uh, uh, seeing it. Uh, I, I kept feeling a, a, a sort of disassociation because on the one hand, uh, uh, the character of Mason goes through things that I never went through. My parents did not get a divorce. I lived in the same house until I moved away for college. I didn't move around a lot. Uh, I had longer terms, more stable relationships that lasted basically throughout the entirety of high school for me. So, so, so my experiences as a boy were in many ways in, in profoundly different than the experiences uh, uh, that, 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 uh, that Mason had. Um, and also complicating things is the film begins in Houston, where I lived for eight years, and where I lived when they were filming this movie. I mean, they, they go to so many places. I'm like, that place is 15 minutes from my house. I went there all the time. I could have stumbled on that place while they were filming accidentally. Um, and so it was, there was a lot of happy memories, but that's when I was in grad school, which is a very different time in my life than when I was the age of the character. So that, that, that's just one of those idiosyncratic things that threw me off a little bit from fully getting into the skin of the character. All that having been said, by the time I got to the end of this film, I was it, it bowled over by the sense of, of nostalgia and longing and how well the film just captured not any particular thing about being a boy, about growing up or maturing. The film does a very good job, I think, of staying away from melodrama, of focusing too much on the cliche events uh, that, that a lot of other movies want to focus on, and just capturing 
you know, and, and from a bird's eye perspective, the process of growing up, the process of maturing, of coming into yourself, and all the things that that entails and all that that deals with, that is an incredibly difficult thing for a film, for any film to do. And I think it takes a, tr it is a tremendous credit to Richard Linkletter's uh, vision and his tenacity and his commitment to this project and to telling this story in an incredibly difficult uh, way from just a production standpoint to do uh, that he's able to pull this off. Uh, and as such, I think this film gets, deserves all the praise that it gets. Uh, it, it is indeed a film that requires patience. It requires attention. Uh, it, it, again, speaking of structure, there's very little in the way of clear structure in this film, which is something we can talk about later. Um, but yeah, uh, 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 Count Me Sold, uh, this film is wonderful. Wow, uh, this is fantastic. I'm glad that you enjoyed it as much as you did. Um, I, I'm a little... I, 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 my experiences uh, were were probably a little bit more along the lines of Mason that said my parents never got a divorce and my father wasn't a drunk. Well, I, you know, my stepfather wasn't a drunk uh, because I didn't have a stepfather. Uh, so, yeah, they, and I think you're right about a lot of the points that you talked about, uh, especially in its... Uh, ability to avoid some of the cliche things like we you know mason experiences uh experiments i should say with drugs and alcohol um and and all of those things but that's not those are never this isn't this boy's life um we got a, a an abusive father um abusive stepfather and once again this is not this boy's life uh, this is a different film, and it's it's a film that's trying to reach for a lot of the things that you're talking about. Um, now, I think that one of the things I found is that this is Richard Linkletter sort of going back to some of his old tropes with, you know, uh, anti-establishment characters and a young character who's trying to discover him where he fits in an establishment world. Uh, so I think there's a lot of sort of old, old link letter at play in this film. And some of that feels a little shoehorned in, at least for my taste. Um, and I also think that the character of Mason is in, there are parts of this movie when he is a receptacle for other people's drama. And I don't think that L.R. Coltrane's performance is registering a deep or personal reaction to the events that are going on. So if anything, I wish that the central performance was a little bit a li that, that he was a little bit more like Emma Nelson uh, in, in Where Do You Go Bernadette because I think she, uh, her face and, and, and her manner, everything was, was truly communicating what that the, the character's inner life. And I didn't necessarily see that a lot with L.R. Coltrane. That said, you mentioned the production. That's one thing I, I neglected to mention in my introduction and probably should have. This is a film that was shot... Uh, like they over the course of um, I believe it was seven or eight years. Let me I'm gonna double check that real twelve. Twelve years, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he was. Uh, I, I'm I'm doing this real quick. I know I I used to know that uh, off the top of my head, and of course what I did is failed to look up the thing that I uh, that I used. So he was seven years old and nineteen when it was finished. So you are right, Garrett. It is it is twelve years that he uh, that this film was in production, and so that's an incredible production feat. And uh, it's you know it's almost unfair to blame Richard Linkletter that he didn't cast a twelve year old that was better uh, a better actor when he was nineteen uh, because I think that it was it's the later uh, years of of Mason's life where he really needs to register some of this stuff I think specifically of the scene where it's Patricia Arquette's last scene in the movie and she talks about how. And this is a brilliant monologue, and she delivers it so powerfully, how her life is just this series of milestones. And then she traces all of the milestones that we've got to see her. And then it switch, it doesn't even, it just cuts from her giving this really powerful and emotional monologue. For, from It cuts from her doing this to Mason putting the stuff in his... 
uh, put it, putting his stuff in his truck. And I almost wish that we had cut back to a single of Mason where he does something, reacts to something, because this is a profound moment for the woman who is the most important person in his life. And yet I wish that I would get to see something about Mason's response to this. And so that's why I say that he kind of works as a receptacle for other people's drama rather than a participatory character. I, I, I'm not unsympathetic to that. Yeah, I agree. It was, it was an excellent monologue and one again that resonates with me. I, I, I think about that series of milestones idea quite a lot. Um, and again, it's, it's somewhat strange in some ways because, and, and I think this is a credit to the film, is that when, when we look back upon our lives, it's like that, that excellent Kierkegaard quote, right, about how life uh, can only be understood backwards, but it has to be lived forwards. When we look back upon our life, we impose structure on it. You know, we, we, we have these sort of defining moments that we think of, uh, you know, whether it be moving from one place to another, starting a new job, starting a new relationship or whatever. But much of the time, as we're going forward, we don't really feel that those the, uh, those milestones are quite so transformative, you know. And so I, I think the film, again, lacks a clear structure um, in, in, in a traditional movie sense of it. You know, you, you don't get these focus on these turning points in their life. Um, uh, so to bring it back to your point, I, I'm not sure if this necessarily was intended, but I think what I took from it is the reason why there wasn't some big, profound, dramatic moment where where uh, Mason responds to, to his mother's grief is because that would have sort of fallen into a movie trope. It would have, that, that would have been, you know, the, 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 the moment that w uh, would have been so, so, so powerful. But a, a lot, I think the point of the film is that these moments are daily these moments of the texture of our daily lives they're they're not the profound oscar clips that you you see showing up i mean again that that like you said that he experiments with drugs and alcohol but that's never there's never a drama about that you know that it, it's sort of it, it's clear that he's experimenting he's learning he's living he's growing up he's maturing but it never becomes a crisis you know it never becomes he gets never gets arrested for it never does root threaten to ruin his life or anything like that that kind of intense melodrama that so often comes across in films this film wants to avoid that and I think that you know, perhaps the reason why they didn't have him respond in a more much profound or dramatic way is precisely because that's not what we do in life. I mean, I mean not, I mean, not that we never do it, but that most of these moments in life, these daily day-to-day -day moments, aren't that profound. I mean, they're profound in the sense that they make up the fabric of our lives, but they're not going to be on the Oscar clip when you know when we're in memoriam and we're, we're we pass on. Yeah, but that's I I'm I'm sympathetic to your point, um, especially since I literally agreed with you when you were praising the film for the same things that uh, that I'm I'm kind of criticizing it for. But it seems as though Mason's entire life is devoid of Oscar clips, and uh, you know maybe it's just because I'm an overly dramatic person sometimes. But my life is not devoid of Oscar clips. There are pl there are a couple of those that I can point to within the last couple years even, not much less my entire childhood, which for me was rather tumultuous. You know, I, I, I experienced a great deal of mo emotions during that time, and uh, I just don't know if we're, we're seeing that at all in Mason's life, and that's where I was, that's what I'm, I'm noting. Yeah, and Again, I, it's, not, it's not that there aren't any such moments in people's lives. It's that I think that this film was deliberately trying to avoid being like other films and making that the centerpiece. Mm -hmm. and making it be a film instead of about boyhood as a whole, but about six or seven specific things that define his boyhood. Uh, you know, the dramatic moment, the first time he breaks up with his girlfriend, whatever. The, 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 it wanted to be more organic than that. And if it started to put the focus on these dramatic moments, it would have taken away from that more organic whole, I think. And it, it would have been, it would have seemed more traditional. You know, it would have seemed a film about an abusive stepfather, or about, uh, you know, a first love, about losing first love, about uh, uh, you know, having to leave all your friends behind and move and stuff like that. And all that is there, but it's not played for effect. It's played, I think, in a very, very humanistic, organic, realistic way. Um, and I think, so I think it avoids the temptation to play into that, uh, that, that Oscar clip, uh, movement. 
That's a fair, that's a fair counter. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think that also sort of speaks to the different ways that you and I, uh, read movies. Um, let's talk about how great Ethan Hawke is in this film. Uh, we, we gave, uh, some kudos to Patricia Arquette, which I think is, um, absolutely appropriate but ethan hawk is fantastic in this movie as the kind of father who isn't always there but when he's there he's really there and i thought that that was a a really good dramatic choice on the part of link letter and i thought it was uh carried forward very well by ethan hawk ethan hawk i think has this 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 incredibly powerful ability to always seem like he's just being Ethan Hawke, no matter how different the role is from what it's, you know, he, he, he feels so natural in so many of his roles. And this is no exception. I think, you know, I, if Ethan Hawke weren't a film star, if he were instead kind of a down on your luck guy who had a kid, I think this is almost exactly what he would be like. Uh, now, that's not necessarily a compliment to him as a person because yeah, the, the father has obvious moral shortcomings. Uh, but at the same time, it is a compliment to him as an actor uh, that he uh, sort of so seamlessly just sort of walks into this role. And you know, again, it's worth remembering that you know he, 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 he's coming on, he's acting for a couple of weeks and then he's off this role for a couple of years and then he's back into the role. Um, that's an incredibly challenging thing to do for all of the actors uh, uh, in this uh, 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 this film and in, the, in, in a film made in this way. Um, but for for Linkletter, you know, who's for, for Ethan Hawke, it's it, it is almost like he's walking back into his son's life for the first time in the last year or two or whatever, and it, he's wanting to catch up with him, and it creates this sense of that we're wanting to catch up with him too, right? Yeah. That we haven't seen him in two years or, or whatever, however long it's been. Um, and yeah, you can't help but like him, uh, um, but you also can't help but sort of feel that you know he's not necessarily the most positive influence. You can contrast him with it, with, with, with uh, Mason's two separate step stepdads in the film, uh, uh, both of whom are more disciplinarian, both of whom are sort of more establishment, if you will. But at the same time, again, I'm not a parent, I'm not a father, but I do understand that there, you know, you do at a certain point have to teach discipline and you do have to, to teach responsibility. And uh, Ethan Hawke's character wasn't doing that. And so it's kind of in some ways unfairly fallen on the stepfathers to have to play that role. Well, I think it unfairly falls on his mother to play that role. I mean, she is a very stabilizing force within his life. She is someone who matures much faster than Ethan Hawke's character. And uh, she is somebody, I think, that... Like, you talked about how Linkletter's films often focus on the men, and I think that's the case in Boyhood. I mean, it's clear that Mason is the protagonist of this movie, but uh, his mother is given a ton of time olivia is given a ton of time to breathe and to develop and to be a fully fleshed out character so if anything i would say that link letter has has matured as an artist over the course of his career and uh has found the ability to uh give women more interesting and nuanced and complex roles in his later later career um oh, sorry. go ahead go ahead now, as I said, I did find it, it, it was, uh, it took a while, I think, to become Mason's movie. Uh, in, in the beginning, for, for probably at least as long as they were in Houston, uh, I felt that the, the screen time and the focus was fairly evenly spread out between him, his sister, and his mother. Um, uh, we had, a, uh, it, it felt more like a family film, I think, at least until they, they, they left Houston. So, um, uh, but after that, I think it definitely, we settled more into his perspective. So, yeah. Um, let's talk about, I mean, do you think that this, I, t- I proffered the thesis before that, uh, Linkletter's films kind of fall into these, uh, establishment versus anti-establishment characters, and of course his heroes are always anti-establishment. Do you think this film falls into that as well? I wouldn't have said so had you not necessarily brought it up that way. I mean, to a certain extent, of course, any anyone going through adolescence is going to feel like they are having to sort of rebel against authority, right? I mean, that's part of sort of natural maturation of sort of finding your own ego. I can't remember the stages of psychological development uh, from, from way back when, but you know, one of these stages is, is, is pushing back against uh, the, the rules that are imposed upon you so you can assert your ego and so forth. Uh, and so it's part of maturation. So in that sense, any film that gets adolescence right is probably going to have that dimension to it. Um, but if, if that was sort of a, a, a deliberate theme, there's lots, there's ways in which they could have played that more to the hilt 
and made him more of a rebellious kid than he was. Um, you know, there, there obviously is some tension and some discomfort and, and, and some frustration um, uh, with the, the overall system, but, but, but far less than I think, you know, maybe, I, I, maybe not necessarily myself, but certainly a lot of people I went to school with were, were much more anti-establishment uh, than, than Mason is in this film. Yeah. Um, so, what would you? Uh, I I'll go ahead and score it first, unless you want to to say more about the movie. Um, my score is three and a half. It's a solid recommend, and I really like it. But you know, I have a few issues with it. It sounds like you're a lot higher on this movie than I am. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I have only watched it the one time, and I did just finish watching it like an hour ago. Um, uh, and you know, I, I am by nature a nostalgic person, so maybe it's not that hard. You know, both with my, my love uh, and, and, and longing for for Houston, and of course my lost youth to quote uh, uh, to allude to to the Longfellow. Um, uh, a film like this, you know, again, it, it requires patience. Like I said, it took some time for it to settle in. It, it was slow. It was unstructured. But once you get to the end of that two hour, 45 minutes, it had its emotional hooks in me. And I walked away feeling like, uh, feeling longing. And uh, um, you know, perhaps it's an, an error to, to, to let that kind of effective uh, response be the guiding uh, pole star for, for a review. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to fall prey to the effective fallacy, as some people call it. Um, but, uh, but I can't help it, but, but, but feel like, yeah, this is a film that brought me back. And I think it had on me... I think exactly the effect that Richard Linklater was going for, um, and, and it's it, it's hard not to admire its accomplishment as a piece of filmmaking, and and for me at least not to be moved emotionally by the the, the journey that it tracks. So yeah, I'm four and a half on this one. This film, I, I thought it was wonderful. Very good, very good. I'm glad I'm glad you liked it so much. You know, this is uh, it was one of those films that. Uh, I'm glad that you saw, like, I've got a lot of films that I've recommended to you before, and this was one of them, uh, because I thought that this was definitely in your alley, um, but I, uh, even though it's not as much in mine, um, but we've got to admire the technical brilliance associated with it. Let's move on to the latest news that just broke today. It's been sort of a slow entertainment news month. Uh, almost a slow entertainment news summer, and then just the world ended for the MCU, it seems. Um, late, the latest announcement per deadline and, uh, and other sources that uh, the MCU is in a bit of trouble. Sony and Disney, Sony and Marvel Studios, the head of which is Kevin Feige, have ended their relationship and Spider-Man is no longer uh, the the Spider-Man sequels are no longer going to be part of the MCU. This means that a lot of the things that were set up in Far From Home may or may not pay off. Um, I don't know. What was your first reaction to this news, Garrett? Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm going out on a limb here. I, I may have to eat my words, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. I think that this story leaked because someone is trying to, to, to position themselves. They're trying to, 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 to leverage for uh, greater bargaining power, and public embarrassment is the way to do it. I'm not sure exactly who it is or whether or not it's a wise ploy, but uh, it, it is simply too beneficial for everyone involved for them to completely walk away. Now, again, I understand that in business, sometimes you have to play hardball, sometimes you have to make sacrifices, you have to cut off your limb in order to, to live again to fight another day, if I can mix my metaphors there. Um, but uh, I I would bet a small amount of money, not a lot of money, but a small amount of money uh, that uh, uh, we have not heard the last of this, that's going to come back, there's going to be further negotiations, uh, and then somehow or another, they're going to mend fences and come back together. Now that, again, whether or not exact role that Kevin Feige has to play in this, what sort of percentage deal has to get cut between Disney and Sony, I don't know. Obviously, uh, I'm not privy to any sort of special negotiations. Um, but uh, the, the people here are too interested in films and, of course, more and more so too interested in making money uh, to, 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 to walk away from such a mutually beneficial relationship um, just because there was some tension, or just because they couldn't come to agreement now. Someone is playing the press, and maybe they're playing it damn well. 
Yeah, let's uh, talk a little bit. Now, obviously, a lot of this is unconfirmed, but according to reports, Disney has gone to Sony and tried to negotiate a 50-50 sharing of the revenue from future Spider-Man films. Uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, for example, which literally today just broke $1 billion worldwide, Sony gets all of that money, but uh, Disney retains the merchandising rights. Do you have a correction? Yes, the Disney does not get all, uh, Sony does not get all of that money. Sony gets most of that money. Uh, 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 Disney gets the merchandising rights and 5% of the first day uh, uh, receipts, which actually is not insignificant because the first day usually is the single largest day of the, of the fifth day. Yeah, thank you for that correction. Yeah, so, but the lion's share certainly goes to Sony, and uh, it was rumored that Disney asked for 50-50. Sony did not reply with a counter offer and simply walked away from the negotiating table, uh, leaving Spider-Man in the lurch. Um, and that's, I, I would like to believe that what you're saying is true. I would like to say that uh, this will be another James Gunn situation where there will be a public, uh, a, a news drops, a uh, public outcry, a cooling off period, and then we'll be covering this story again in a couple months like Spider-Man's back in the MCU. What this means artistically, though, is what's really interesting to me. Let's imagine that this deal goes through, well, this lack of deal, shall we say, goes through, and what is what does Spider-Man 3 look like, especially given the end of Far From Home? Far From Home was a movie that actually worked for me, as opposed to Homecoming, and so I'm wondering how you pick up a lot of the threads both in the MCU films, because it did seem as though Spider-Man was poised to be a main character and kind of take over for Iron Man in future MCU films. Uh, what do what do future MCU films look like without Spider-Man, and what does Spider-Man three look like without the MCU? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I obviously am not privy to the details, only hearing the rumors. Uh, I certainly don't want to cast blame or say I know for sure whose fault it is and so forth. But based on what I'm hearing, it does seem strange for Sony to just walk away. It seems like a counteroffer meeting somewhere in the middle would be not only standard business practice, but uh, 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 profitable and good. Um, and it's also the fact that I think I share a lot of people's skepticism that Sony could do a solid Spider-Man film on their own. I mean, the last good one, I think, was Spider-Man 2, uh, and uh, that was several Spider-Man solo Sony Spider-Man films ago. Um, so if they if they did have to go off and do their own, I don't know how solid it would be, how good it would be, especially since, as you mentioned, they would have to somehow retcon a lot of the material that they were clearly setting up for future uh, stories. So yeah, there would have to be some serious rewrites at whatever stage they're in for, 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 for conceptualizing, uh, blocking out, outlining, and screenwriting. Um, and... The, the, the awkwardness of that alone would hang over a, a film. So Sony, I think, has to realize that uh, they have a lot to lose here. Uh, uh, they, and as such, it seems like coming back to the table with some sort of compromise offer is seriously in their own best interests. They can't do this by themselves. Now, maybe 50-50 is too uh, uh, greedy on Disney's part. After all, it's not like they don't have enough of their own money-making machines to, to, to dominate and take over the world. Maybe let, let Sony have uh, have something, perhaps, here. Um, <laughs> But, uh, uh, <laughs> when you're battling for world domination, you can't go half measure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the mouse has has, got, has has definitely laid out their territory. So yeah, um, I think uh, I think that again, the financial incentives, the artistic incentives, the public relations, the the, the long term prospects for future uh, franchise uh, 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 growth possibilities. There, there's just way too much gravity that's going to pull both of them back to that table. Yeah, this is definitely, as it is, this is a lose-lose situation, and uh, I I hope you're right, because uh, Spider-Man without uh, the MCU, the MCU without Spider-Man is a darker place, and Spider-Man without Disney 
uh, and Kevin Feige behind the reins. I mean, Spider-Man 3, there's one tweet I saw that uh, I'm glad Sony is sticking with the tradition of fucking up Spider-Man 3, um, which was a brilliant, brilliant take on this thing. Um, so, yeah, we, we shall see, and we'll continue to follow that story. So, uh, next week... What are we doing next week except for Blinded by the Light, the movie that made zero money uh, the last weekend, but got really rave critical reviews. Will we like it just as much? We will be pairing that movie with uh, a 1991 film called The Commitments, a story about Irish soul singers. So be sure to join us next week where we discuss those films. Until then, I'm Jim. And I'm Garrett. And this has been Jim and Garrett at the Movies. Good night, everybody.